The myelogus plastic syndromes are a heterogeneous collection of diseases that necessitate an individualized treatment approach and careful monitoring in an effort to slow disease progression and prevent complications. In this OncLive peer exchange, a panel of experts in oncology and hematology will discuss some of the challenges in managing the disease, including accurate risk stratification, complications associated with transfusion dependence, and practical considerations in the use of disease-modifying therapies and stem cell transplantation, and we'll discuss some of the data released at the ASH 2019 annual meeting. I'm Mikhail Sekaris, Director of the Leukemia Program and Professor of Medicine at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Joining me today are Dr. Rami Kamraji, Senior Member, Section Head of Leukemia and MDS, and Vice Chair of the Malignant Hematology Department at the Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute in Tampa, Florida. Dr. Ellen Ritchie, Associate Professor of Medicine and Assistant Director of the Leukemia Program at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York, and Dr. Jamil Chameau, a medical professor at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you for joining us. Let's get started. So I wanted to start actually by talking a little bit about how we even diagnose myelodysplastic syndromes. So what is it when you have a patient who comes to you with a referral for myelodysplastic syndrome and that diagnosis hasn't been established, but let's say it's an older person who has multiple cytopenias, what's your first step in evaluating that person? I like to make sure that we rule out some of the more common uh, conditions that might be resulting in cytopenia. So I think everybody deserves to get the usual B12 folate. And for certain patients who may have uh, bypass surgeries, perhaps think about copper deficiency. Uh, and I guess if you don't have any other explanation for the cytopenias, then I think everybody should get a bone marrow biopsy with cytogenetics. And whether or not you get an NGS depends actually on where you are. I typically get an, an NGS with every patient that um, um, has the potential diagnosis of NGS. And then I think we go by the WHO classification, which uh, has somewhat simplified the uh, approach to um, making a diagnosis of MDS by incorporating cytopenias, uh, morphologic changes, molecular and cytogenetic. That's great. And by NGS, you mean next generation sequencing. Yes. So next generation sequencing, um, how available is that to everybody? Is everybody able to send that? Um, I think that it's available to me very easily, both in our, in our institution and we can send it out. The complication is, you know, paying for the NGS panel. Um, so when I send an NGS panel, I always worry about whether or not insurance is going to cover that panel for that particular patient. And it governs actually where you can send that particular panel because I have my favorite places to send NGS panel where I feel very secure in what the results are, but sometimes I have to send it somewhere where I'm actually not familiar with that organization, So, and that's insurance driven. So I think there are challenges to sending the NGS panel, um, mainly because you're concerned about coverage. But I think it's very helpful when you get these results back to help stratify your patients as to what their risk is of, of having a more serious disease. So we have representatives from Illinois, Ohio, New York, and Florida. And I think it's state by state whether or not mm -hmm. next generation sequencing panels for myeloid malignancies are covered. What about you, Rami? What about in Florida? How well are they, they actually covered? I think they're well covered, and you know, I, I think it's becoming more standard of care to get them. I think the utilization varies a little bit by the community practices or oncology. They are available now even for community oncologists. I would say in, in our practice, still more than half of the patients when we see them referred for second opinion have not had a next generation sequencing test done. So it's becoming more used, but still a lot of the patients are not getting those at time of diagnosis, which I think is important. I think it's important to emphasize that they are not part of the diagnostic criteria. So having a mutation is not a diagnostic, but it definitely helps you, you know, making the diagnosis in the right setting. Uh, the challenge, obviously, we know about, you know, that patients with idiopathic cytopenias of unknown significance could have mutations. Patients could have what we call CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis of undetermined uh, potential, which is 
clonal hematopoiesis by aging. So they are not diagnostic, but there is no doubt that they help. And in right settings, uh, you find an SF3B1 mutation with ring sideroblasts. I think that's going to help you. In monocytosis, you see a concomitant TET2 SRSF2 mutation. That's going to help you with the diagnosis. But it's important to emphasize that the WHO does not include them as a diagnostic criterion. Yeah, I'm very happy that you say that because often some, uh, I've seen community physicians make a diagnosis of potential MDS just because the NGS panel shows an abnormality and yet you don't have morphologic uh, abnormality consistent with dysplasia. So I think it's very important to put that together to make a diagnosis, an accurate diagnosis, I should say. That's a really great point. So there are abnormalities in next generation sequencing that can be revealed that people acquire as they age, what, what uh, Rami referred to as CHIP, the DNMT3A abnormalities, ASXL1 and TET2 are, are probably the, uh, the biggest culprits that uh, we, we've been made aware of. They're also common in, in MDS.